Welcome everyone and welcome to the Skype show episode 9. On today's episode I'm joined by Uma Kabir and Russell White from Sonus and Nectar and also Ken Lasko, um, our Office and Service and Services MVP. On this episode we're going to be talking about three topics in particular and one session one will be the migration methodology and that will be presented by myself um, end-to-end um, monitoring, and that will be presented by uh, Uma and Russell from Sonos and Nectar. And in session three, we'll be handing over to Ken Lasko to deliver a session on advanced voice stuff. As for with every episode, you can catch up on Channel 9 on uh, or via our website or on our Twitter, Skype for Beast Show, and the link's provided in the slides there. Moving on to the migration methodology. So before we move on to, to this um, topic in particular, I just want to declare that uh, this is not a Microsoft methodology that's been released. It's just been my, my way of approaching a migration with uh, different types of customers. And I hope to share my experiences uh, with you during these slides. So typically uh, when you install Skype for Business internally, perhaps, um, there's a lot of pressure on yourselves um, to deliver that solution in a, in a given time frame. You have to um, support multiple different systems and often you can't, uh, can't dedicate enough time to the project to ensure smooth migration. So perhaps your, your story is similar to this where you've, uh, you've been given a, a set of time to install Skype for Business. You've um, done some very high level uh, testing on it make sure that you can make a receiver call and then you inform your boss that you've you know you've in, you've deployed this system uh, it appears to work for as far as you can tell and your boss turns around and see it and tells you right get on with it you need to migrate these users in the quickest time frame possible and uh, don't worry about the overtime that, that he'll pay it for you etc and off you go and then you start migrating users so there are a few um, things wrong with this approach, I, I would say. Uh, it, the typically, the first um, the first thing, obviously, you haven't got enough time to fully appreciate the end users um, and their functionality. You haven't got time to fully uh, understand whether your IT estate supports the, inf the um, software and the infrastructure required for Skype for Business. And that ultimately leads to a very rushed migration where um, items or features get missed, some certain configuration gets missed, and users um, will have a very poor uh, experience of it and will obviously end up leading to a bunch of complaints and the service or Skype not being adopted in the, in the manner which you hoped. So there's a few um, challenges when you're migrating users from a legacy system to Skype for Business that you need to maintain uh, may, may need to main, consider. And uh, the, the first and most paramount um, topic that you need to consider is the end user adoption and tooling. So by this, I mean you, user training, user awareness, communication, and do they have um, the sufficient tools in order to perform their day-to-day -day common tasks on Skype for Business? The other challenge that we've got to work out is whether we can actually support the native features of the legacy world in Skype for Business or whether we need any third party applications, any custom development work, et cetera, or perhaps we just need to work uh, in a slightly more, in a slightly different manner um, to, to the legacy world. The other um, challenges are hardware logistics. So that by this, I'm talking about delivering peripherals to the users because you could be in a, in a geographically dispersed um, business with sites dotted around the country or even the world. And how do you ensure that the users are going to get the right peripherals, headsets or desk phones, et cetera, at the time of migration? As well, this is often assumed from uh, a multi many people that the network and device configuration will just automatically cope with Skype for Business. And that way may well be the case in the majority of the uh, circumstances, but here what we need to be looking at is things like um, quality of service, um, firewall ports, bandwidth consumption, 
etc. So we need to ensure that actually the network is configured to a, to a point whereby it sufficiently supports your Skype for Business workload. In terms of device configuration, I'm talking about the uh, operating system and um, application patch level, etc. Interoperability, this is where we're talking about integrating with any on-site um, dependency, uh, any on on-site systems such as uh, door access systems, lift phones, common area phones, um, video meeting rooms, etc. You know, so here uh, we need to consider all that into into the equation. So into user dependencies, what I mean by that is the more advanced workflows of users. So the majority of users will have a, a single calling panel or a single method to call to the PS10. They won't be dependent on anybody else or any other system. They'll just be assigned a line URI and they can make and receive calls. But for the more advanced users, or users have uh, typically boss secretary scenarios or perhaps even members of uh, an agent as a hunt group, for instance, these are going to have inter-user dependencies or inter-system dependencies. So we need to ensure that those are taken into consideration when migrating over from legacy world to, to Sky for Business. And the reason why um, we need to, to ensure that is obviously if we migrated one user across and they had these dependencies, we didn't migrate everybody else with those dependencies, then obviously that, that one user is going to be affected. In terms of business change here, this is going to be common to you and bespoke to your environment. So it's the length of time to uh, to raise any change requests and uh, go through your local uh, change process to get approval for those changes. So you need to consider that aspect when you're timing your migrations. So often all these challenges um, will either get found out along the way in a rushed migration where you're constantly trying to um remediate your, your issues on the fly and you know and uh, that ultimately leads to a lot of problems a lot of uh, business disruption and ultimately that will be classed against the success of the project so the migration methodology this is the methodology that i use to um to migrate customers from Legacy World to Sky for Business. And I break these steps and these considerations in, into three core areas, core components, our core, work, core workflows even, uh, before we get to a, a point of migration where we can actually successfully migrate um, the users from, uh, from Old World to Sky for Business. And these are broken out into three dedicated areas. So I'm focusing on the user, I'm focusing on their workspace and I'm also focusing on the back end infrastructure. And I'll deal, uh, I'll go into a bit more detail of these in, uh, in a couple of moments. But essentially, these um, three components or three workflows, they can be executed simultaneously together so that they, when you work through the, the workflow, you can you choose or go through all three at the same time and then you should reach the migration ready state. Um, at the same time for all three um, three areas. Once you get to the migration state, then you should, in theory, uh, be in a very good position to migrate that user and know with a, a certain level of um, certainty um, that your migration is going to be successful. Obviously, there will be an element of the unknown, but we can, following this methodology, you can be you know, 80, 90 percent sure that uh, you've covered everything and the migration is going to be success successful and you won't need to issue a rollback process. So in terms of user readiness, here is where we're focusing on the user's features and we're looking at things like what their DID information is, what their extension is. Do we need to normalize any numbers to make sure that their extension routes properly? Um, do we need to consider any um, voicemail um, services for that user? And we slowly build a map of consumed features on the legacy world that the that user uses. And we build uh, out a feature matrix based on the native functionality of Skype for Business so whether we can achieve feature parity between um, the user's legacy features and when they're coming through Skype for Business. Now, 
in some cases there may be some feature disparity um, and therefore we have a couple of options that we can mitigate with this so we can go back to the customer and say well look um, the users using um, very advanced uh, workflows on a legacy PBX that we can't natively recreate on Skype for business. Um, not in the same manner, at least, but we can effectively give them um, an alternative way of doing it, but, but in a slightly different process, with a slightly different process. Now that mitigation could be accepted by the company uh, and the customer, but ultimately they could say, well, no, I want something that uh, is a bit more advanced, in which case we can see, well, actually in order to achieve that we're going to need some assistance in terms of additional software and then once we get the get that agreement from the customer we can then move on through the the user workflow so in terms of interdependency so again like the boss secretary scenarios um home group um membership so it's a user a part of a, a, an advanced workflow with a boss secretary are they a, are they a delegate or are they a delegator? And then we need to use that information then to collect all the dependent users and dependent features of that, uh, dependent functions um, for that user into um, a data set so that we can say, well, actually, we're moving this one user, but they have 14 delegates or they have 10 people in their um, agent group that we need to incorporate in the same move in order to maintain uh, functionality for that those users when we move across. And in terms of end user communication and training, this is critically important to the success of your migration platform because users are generally your best um, your best assets and your um, your best tool to actually evaluate the success of your migration project. So you want to keep them on side. Um, you want to communicate effectively with them and wait far out in advance. So don't just drop an email on the day before migration to say, you're going to be migrated from a via to Skype for Business tomorrow and expect these changes actually communicate within weeks, if not months in advance. So in terms of effective communication, we need to build those migration groups up. Um, and what I find is that if you involve the user in their migration planning or in your migration planning rather, um, they were much more engaged and much more energetic and positive towards the change rather than sitting back going, um, oh, this is just going to be another failed IT pro project. Um, so one of the tips that I, I tell my customers to do when we're arranging migration groups is to schedule the migration of a user for a particular date, but then give them an option of changing that date to uh, an alternative, maybe offer them two other alternative dates to, to that date. Um, and that shows empathy towards their personal circumstance. So perhaps that user might be um, on holiday the day after migration, for instance, or they might be on holiday during migration. And they say, well, hang on, actually, um, I want to be present when, when my telephone system migrates because I'm just going to forget. So that really helps to drive adoption for Skype for Business and, and, and your project. In terms of training, don't just offer the training um, to users. There's a few approaches that you can do here. You can do a train the trainer approach whereby you nominate uh, a few key employees in each site to act as the champion. So for any Skype for Business related questions, the users in that site will go to the champion for. Um, or alternatively, you can do computer-based training um, and then actually track that training has been attended by, by your entire workforce, which is ultimately the better approach. So the training doesn't need to be very low level. Um, it doesn't have to go into the nitty gritty of Skype for Business. It just needs to be very high level, showing that the features of the Skype for Business client, showing how easy it is to transfer a call, showing how easy it is to convert a peer-to-peer -peer call into a conference, how easy it and those sort of, sorts of things, make it fun, make it short. You know, you're talking no more than sort of 10 minute nugget based training sessions that they need to attend. But actually keep a track of, of that training, make sure that they have attended it before you've migrated the, them into Skype for Business. So not, don't just send a link out and assume that they're going to watch those uh, computer based training nuggets, um, but actually put some kind of authentication in, uh, 
in, in front of that training so that you can actually report cases that say that well, actually we can assume based on um, users logging uh, that they've um, they've watched those those training sessions. In terms of workspace readiness, so often people say, well, why are you working, worrying about the workspace? So it's an important consideration. So when we talk about the workstation here, I'm talking about the user's laptop or the desktop device. So here we need to need to draw a line in the sand to say that, well, actually for Skype for Business, we need to support a minimum PC specification. We need to support a minimum OS and a minimum Skype for Business app version. So when you're looking at, um, at the workstation, you need to pull the reports off for all those workstations to ensure that they meet a minimum specification. Uh, if you don't do this and you assume that people have the tools to do the job, uh, let's say um, you when you do your training, you do your training videos on Windows 10 and you do Skype for Business 2016 client um, training so that they get the full uh, experience throughout the training as what the UI should look like where you can find the, the Skype for Business application on your desktop, et cetera. And then they come to their machine and they have Windows 7 with a Link 2010 client. That training is null and void because the users are going to see a different system. So, and that's going to cause um, adoption issues as well. So workstation assessments in terms of make sure that their baseline throughout your environment is of critical, critical importance for your migration project. It also allows you to put a level of service um, agreement against them and supportability to say that it's a supported platform both internally and, and externally as well. So that is a common, you know, it's a common point in time that we can troubleshoot from. In terms of connectivity, so here we're talking about the physical or the wireless connectivity of the laptop to the, to your network. So, and this covers both last mile and one link uh, connectivity as well. So here we need to um, understand how the user connects to the to the LAN. So if they have a wide connection, do they go through an internal switch on the desk phone, for instance, and then the desk phone connects to the to wall socket, or do they connect directly to the wall socket for their laptops or desktops? If they connect via their phones, then obviously there's a, a question now on peripherals whether the user is going to continue is going to have a new Skype for Business phone or whether that legacy phone is going to be replaced. So if the legacy phone is going to be replaced, then obviously we can, the user can continue to connect um, in a similar manner, provided the, the desk phone that they get getting is going to support it, but continue to, to connect to the network through the internal switch of the phone. If they're not having um, a desk phone, then that could cause uh, some connectivity issues if you're not prepared for it whereby if they reconnect their laptop directly to the wall socket on the phone, perhaps the network's configured on their own VLAN, for instance, and uh, the laptop actually drops onto the voice uh, network rather than the data network and cause some, some serious problems for the user. So that type of connectivity um, method we need to figure out for the, for the users as well. In terms of, of one links, obviously we have a multitude of different one links um, how they set up and, and that's all dedicated to you. Um, but we need to actually ascertain the available bandwidth on that link. So perhaps you have a 10 meg link to the, your core data center, perhaps from one site to keep it simple. Perhaps your day-to-day -day traffic is five meg um, at peak rates, but that should give us um, five megabytes of bandwidth per second that we can use for potential voice and, and video. So here we need to create bandwidth policies to ensure that actually we can we support the maximum number of calls that we or communications we can uh, do over that one link, and then we need to limit that that uh, one link to down to that that level. So we can use a networking assessment from Microsoft, the bandwidth calculator from Pat Richard, and all uh, the other free tools that are out there on on the internet to help you calculate your bandwidth and an appropriate the correct bandwidth policies to that link. In terms of environmental, so here uh, we just need to do a desktop or work, workstation assessment, I think it's called in the UK. And here what we are asking the users to do is to actually figure out whether they have enough room on their desk to actually accommodate the peripherals that we're about to, to ship to them. So for instance, and um, this is more common for people who have replacement phones, for instance. 
So they could have a very small Cisco or a via handset on the desk and we could be proposing to them, actually, we're going to replace that with uh, quite a large form factor phone. Let's say it's a Neolink T48G, for instance. And we can send them, um, obviously, pictures of um, the phones. We can um, we can actually survey their desk to ensure through the workstation assessment to ensure that they, we have enough um, free real estate for that phone to sit on. And especially if we're talking about expansion modules as well. So we need to ensure that what kit we're, going, we're shipping to them is actually going to fit physically on the desk. And lastly is the peripheral. So the peripheral side of things that will come out through your um, your end user profiling uh, phase so that you'll be able to ascertain this, you know, what user category each user is going to sit in and what peripherals are going to be needed for that category. So typically for the modern workforce, we're going to be issuing them with Bluetooth or wired headsets, and not typically a desk phone, but perhaps for executives and more advanced users and the secretaries, we're going to issue them desk phones and what have you. So here we need to work out what peripherals we are sending to users and to where. Lastly, that the site services readiness. And this is where we're looking through all the um, back-end functionality of Skype for Business and we're configuring it or pre-configuring Skype for Business to support the site in which we are intending to migrate. So first off, we need to um, ensure that the voice policies, calling plans, PSTN usages and routes are set up correctly for that site. And what I recommend that you do here, even if you have a single installation of Skype for Business and everybody follows and one route to the PSTN from all your sites is actually break your um, your policies, your voice policies and your calling, uh, your PSTN usages and uh, dial plans into site, into user-based um, policies, but, base, but name them um, with a naming convention that references the site in which they're going to be applied to. And this will give you more granularity moving forward. It will help you uh, identify um, easily where the users are and it will help you um, and perhaps any inter interoperability that's going on um, at that site to actually ascertain um, what if any problems are, are potentially going to happen so it's best practice to even though even in that situation to, to create a user user policies for each site which um, which you will so in terms of the voice we can obviously pre-configure all that in advance, we can connect up to SPCs and gateways, and we can do test, but test calling, um, or even test scenarios through the Skype for Business control panel to actually prove that the configuration that we're proposing for that site is actually routing in the in the way that we expect. And also, we need to pre-configure um, more advanced workflows such as hunt groups. Uh, or IVRs that might be dependent, maybe auto attendance as well. And we can use um, the workflows from the legacy world to re and replicate that within the Skype for Business world. Just be mindful that um, customers may need to re-record their, their welcome messages if all the question sets, if it doesn't quite fit the, the Skype for Business uh, ways of work, ways in which the workflow um, operates. We can also assign them temporary line URIs so that we can actually fully identify, or fully test that that workflow to determine that that is actually going to be acceptable to the customer once um, migrated. So we can actually get get, um, get customer sign off on that before we migrate. So the point here is that we can actually fully test the voice platform and the voice routing cases uh, in their entirety before we've even migrated a user so that we can tick that option off as we can say we are relatively comfortable that um, sufficient configuration is correct in order to maintain business as usual process. The next stage is to look at the site amenities and by this I mean um, common area phones basically. So um, do sites need to have common area phones? What locations do these phones need to be installed at? Do they need to be wall mounted or are they just desk? desk mounted, um, whereabouts in the lo in the office do these need to be located, etc. And we can pre-create common area phone accounts in Skype for Business. Again, we can either use real 
DDI numbers or we can use temporary DDI numbers. Um, but we can actually prove at a, a level that the, those types of functionalities are going to work uh, properly and as prescribed. In terms of site interop, this is where we're talking about on-site fax machines, on-site on -site video conference rooms, and any other system that might need to continue to communicate with Skype for Business once you've migrated from legacy world to, to Skype for Business. This will be entirely down to, to your environment. And we're assuming here that there is multiple uh, software packages and, or hardware packages in, between Skype for Business and these um, dependent systems to actually interrupt with. But you can configure here the interoperability at, at the site for this and test that out using test accounts and what have you. So again, you can go to the customer and get sign off before you've migrated that, that site. Again, in site connectivity, I touched on that in the uh, workspace readiness, but it's the other side of um, of that one link. Obviously, we're, we're worried about the um, ensuring that the quality of service uh, group policies are applied to workstations. We're ensuring that actually um, the bandwidth policies that we've we can configure those bandwidth policies that we've calculated and we can actually then test out um, that those policies to ensure that they are being applied to the relevant calls. And in terms of quality insurance, this is where uh, we can actually ensure things like quads, we can ensure um, the right media routes so we can do some um, site based testing. So perhaps you have a demo, uh, temporary workstation at that site that you can use and you can then uh, do a full modality test of, of services from that site to another site so you can prove that actually I can do IM in presence, I can do voice, peer to peer voice, I can do video, I can do PSTN conferencing, I can call international or I can call local, etc. Basically, all your functional workloads um, that you need support from that site, you can go through quality assurance with to ensure that you can tick the boxes of all your dependent services. And once you've done that, obviously get your users, uh, your customers to sign off on that. So by this point, by, walk, by um, walking through these three steps, you should be at a, at a point whereby you can, um, you're ready to migrate. So at this point, we are going to know for certain that we can support the users, um, users features. We can support their, their workflows. We've got the migration groups built so that there's nobody left out on these dependent interdependencies. So we're bringing everyone across so that we can assume that all that's going to work fine. In terms of your, your migration scripts, try and keep it a standard process. So the same script executes for multiple users and multiple sites, excuse me. Um, and that will help to ensure your standard process is followed. So again, give your users an end, a migration date option. And by this, like I said before, actually, uh, tell them when they're going to be migrating and offer alternative dates and if that's not suitable for them. And again, consider that actually have they, trained, have they attended their training or their mandatory training for Skype for Business? If they haven't, perhaps you flag that to management. Perhaps um, you go back to the user and issue them a reminder saying that you must attend this, this training course. Uh, otherwise, we're migrating and you won't know how to use it. And then work out your deadlines and also stick to them. So by this, what I mean is like when you might you've built this process up, you followed your the methodology through from start to end, and you should have also figured out your rollback process as well as your migration process. So you might have determined that actually to migrate a user takes 15 minutes, but to roll back a user takes 30 minutes. So that Complete time is a 45 minute migration process. So perhaps you want to allow an hour um, for that. So that'll give you 15 minutes to migrate, 15 minutes to uh, remediate any uh, unforeseen issues that have come across. But then ultimately you'll get to the half an hour deadline where you know that actually I can't fix this any further now and my time is running out. I need to invoke the rollback process. And therefore, because the rollback process is 30 minutes, then that's the third half an hour is, is your deadline, so you can invoke that. And this helps you get keep within your, your deadlines and make sure you maintain uh, business services. And that, in a nutshell, is the migration methodology. I hope you enjoyed it. 
And thank you very much for watching. I now have the great pleasure of handing over to Uma Kabir and Russell Wyatt to deliver uh, a presentation on UCMP uh, with Nectar and Sonus. Welcome, guys. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm with Umar Kabir from Sonus. We're going to talk over the Nectar UCMP, or Unified Communication Management Platform, offering for SBCs, and some joint development work that two companies have done uh, to enhance the Sonus 1K, 2K SBCs to uh, work with the monitoring solution. As I mentioned, it, it's a joint project between Nectar and Sonus, and the idea is to provide a centrally located monitoring solution to easily monitor uh, multiple geographically dispersed uh, Sonus systems. Nectar Services Corporation was founded in 2006. We focus on advanced software solutions to monitor, manage, and diagnose uh, unified communications networks, primarily hybrid networks. Uh, that's when they become complex. So you have Skype for Business along with Cisco or Skype for Business along with Avaya, or a lot of times we're seeing transitions from the legacy uh, networks over to a unified communication, uh, communication network wrapped around Skype for Business. Uh, we add monitoring on both sides of that, so knowing what's going on with the legacy and then showing the, the adoption and the use and the quality of the unified communications, uh, you know, Skype for Business rollout. We have a deep relationship with Microsoft. We were one of the original SDN API depth partners. That was in 2012, and we were the first qualified monitoring and diagnostic solution in that uh, program. We're also an IT Pro Tools uh, partner, and we were 2016 Microsoft Communications uh, Product of the Year Award finalist. All right, Umar, if you give us a little bit about Sonus. Sure, sure. So welcome everyone, and uh, again, thank you for participating in this in this webinar. Yeah, just a few words about Sonus. You know, we were originally founded in 1997. Uh, we were one of the first uh, companies to really focus on the transition of the marketplace away from traditional TDM, TDM-based communications to TDM to IP, really bridging the TDM world to IP. Uh, in terms of total revenue, you know, we're about a $250 million company a year. We're headquartered in Westford, but we have services that covers about 75 different countries. We have development and sales offices worldwide. We're a company of about 1,000 people or so, and we've really been focused on, on bridging and bringing to market, you know, uh, advanced communications solutions in support of uh, Microsoft Skype for Business from an enterprise perspective, as well as transitioning uh, the service provider core to next generation technologies, accounting for you know the, the really strict requirements for security, strict requirements for mission critical delivery of media, of signaling, so on and so forth. And as you can see, we are a Microsoft uh, Gold Communications partner, and we're really excited about that status. Now, in terms of the Sonus Session Border Controller portfolio, uh, we have a number of products that are span the typical small to medium business all the way to the service provider core. As you can see over to the far right, you know we have some of our larger capacity session border controllers, really designed for very very large enterprise workflows as well as service provider core workflows, service provider uh, peering workflows, so on and so forth. The SBC 7000, as you can see, is a device that scales all the way up to 150,000 sessions, and then you have uh, the peers to the 7000, the 5200, 5100. We have a software only or virtual uh, session border controller solution. But where we're going to be focusing on in terms of the partnership effort uh, for over the course of this webinar, the partnership which we've undertaken with uh, Russell and Nectar happens to be on our SBC, what we call our Edge product line. That's the session border controller, the 2000 series as well as the 1000 series. And as you can see, these are devices that scale anywhere from 160 sessions to 600 sessions. It has support for survivable branch appliance media interworking support for legacy interfaces. These two products in particular, we have undertaken a very exciting development with Russell 
to be able to support uh, Skype for Business deployments that really focus on improving the user experience. Thanks, Umar. What we're going to do here is explain a little bit about the UCMP for SBC offering, and then we'll go into detail about the Sonus integration uh, in particular. So there's two products that make up the UCMP for SBC. First is Unified Communications Foundation, or UC Foundation. It is a health and availability and performance monitoring of the SBCs themselves. So it generally talks to the SBCs via any S APIs they have or SNMP, pulls back information about alarming, alerting, it auto-discovers the configuration, it adds polling automatically, so if a new SIP trunk is turned up, it'll automatically start polling the new, you know, add pollers for that. And it puts it all into context, uh, what we call the dependency tree. So for instance, if a particular interface goes down, which parts of the system will no longer function? It, it shows that graphically. And then it also does the, the performance and the reporting part of that, so looking at capacity, utilization, uh, trending, uh, to know what's going on in the system and when you need to uh, scale up. The second product that's part of the offering is UC Diagnostics. This is a monitoring and diagnostics tool mainly looking at a deeper level than foundation. So it's looking at the SIP signaling, the RTP media, looking for when something goes wrong in signaling, it captures the signaling packets, uh, gives those to you so you can find if there's a problem, you can hand it off to, say, the SIP provider who, who sent the signaling to, to diagnose that. And it also gives a third-party view of the RTP analysis going through the system. So looking at the actual RTP packets, giving things like MOS scores. The idea here is really bracketing of the SBC, so you sit in front and behind the SBC. So if there's a problem, you know, did it come in from the SIP provider, or did it come in from the site itself? And that lets you know what, where the repair needs to occur. Um, if it's a problem from the SIP provider, obviously they need to fix it. So you get the diagnostics and the forensic data you need to hand to the provider and say, here's the problem. Please fix this. It's the stopping the finger pointing. So I'll quickly hit the three components in the, UC, the part of the UCD product. This is mainly to show which parts we don't need once we did the work with Sonus. So there is the manager, which is the main node that you connect to for a UI perspective. There's the UCDP, or the peering point. This does the signaling analysis on the SIP. And then there's the UCDA, or analyzer, which is responsible for the RTP media. Here we see a typical UCMP for SBC deployment consisting of a multi-site enterprise. We've got communications gear in the data center and then devices out at each of the remote sites. And what we're showing is the, the full tooling of the UCMP offer into this, this network. So I've got a UC Foundation box in the data center. I've got a UCD manager and a UCD point up in the data center as well. And then analyzers which are the purple boxes, um, at each site. Uh, also note, in site one and site two, we have a UCDPA, so that's the point and the analyzer. Those are those two components sitting on the same box. Um, that's the orange boxes there at the remote sites. So this will give you full visibility into, say, a call came from site two and out to the SIP provider. You'd see it inside site two as it left site two, as it came into the data center, and then as it left. So if there's a problem in any of those locations, you could tell it was a problem in a site or perhaps a problem with the MPLS provider. So with the work we've done with Sonus here, what we did is we took away the need for those extra devices out at the remote sites. So you can see at site one and site two, we've remo removed the analyzer on the WAN link, and we've removed the PA co combo box that was sitting on the inside of those sites as well. What the SBC does now is sets up a secure tunnel over to one of the, one of the centrally located UCD systems, so the P in the data center here, and then through that secure tunnel sends real-time signaling and then media information uh, to the device. So we don't lose any functionality, but we, we got rid of all the different devices that were needed to see end-to-end uh, -end what's going on. The nice thing here is since the SBC is already doing the analysis of the media and already doing uh, the signaling analysis, it can send that to us uh, with no loss of data um, without the extra overhead we have setting all that information back to one location. The other important thing to notice is we're not sending the media itself through the tunnel, just the quality stats. So there is no leaking of sensitive information outside of the network. Now I'm going to pass it off to Umar to go into a little detail uh, about how this works on inside the Sonus box itself. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what you can see from this, uh, these two little diagrams here, over to the far left, what you can see is the SBC, as Russell had alluded to, 
has on board the capabilities of being able to measure voice quality information associated with the signaling with a particular call as well as the media path as well. So as long as the media happens to transit the SBC and of course the signaling will transit the SBC, we are able to, as the call proceeds, gather various audio metrics, various SIP signaling uh, data and we forward it to the Nectar UCD. And with that data, what the UCMP can do is be able to produce media quality reports and maps, you know, in effect showing what's happening to voice quality around the SBC. And in that way, the UCMP is able to identify, does there happen to be a particular degradation in the voice quality somewhere around that SBC? And allowing IT or whomever the individuals happen to be who are responsible for user experience, uh, Skype for Business user experience, allowing them the opportunity to be able to pinpoint where the trouble is occurring and be able to take the appropriate actions necessary. So the key points coming out of this is that we gather the data natively on our platform and we report that data over to the UCMP platform where the UCMP does its magic and is able to translate that into a pictorial representation of what's happening in the network and be able to guide uh, the IT group, uh, whomever the individuals happen to be responsible for the user experience, guide them to taking the appropriate actions. We wanted to give you a, a little bit more data just exactly how we are able to gather uh, the data that the, that the Nectar UCMP happens to use as it builds out its voice quality reports and the maps, so on and so forth. And you can see the map over to the far right and where that information happens to be presented. An example of where that information uh, might be presented, identifying a hotspot. Over to the left, where we take a look at a typical SBC 1000, 2000. Maybe it's sitting in the branch. It doesn't matter where it happens to be sitting. What happens is that as the signaling and the media transits the SBC, the SBC will take a look at the signaling and the media as it transits through our uh, digital signal processing, processing resources. We are able to directly capture right from the DSPs critical data surrounding voice quality, whether that happens to be MOS, whether that happens to be whatever the metrics happen to be, uh, the exact signaling messages, uh, the when the invites came in, whom the invites actually came, came from, we forward all of that to the UCMP. We gather it and then we forward it. And we are able to gather the metrics and forward to the UCMP platform through SIP notifies in the encrypted channel that Russell had presented a little bit earlier. Uh, we want to make it clear, there's no impact on session density. Uh, there is a slight impact in terms of call setup time. Right now, the call per second that are supported on the SPC 1000, 2000 varies anywhere from three to five calls per second, somewhere in that range. There is a slight degradation when you do turn this service on, but in most cases, uh, most people won't perceive any issue with respect to call setup. Certainly from a total capacity perspective, there's no concerns. And as you can see over to the far right, that data that happens to be forwarded by the SPC 1000, 2000 to the UCMP, it gets reported in the user interface that the UCMP presents to the IT staff for them to be able to confirm that people are experiencing the kind of user, the kind of service that they would expect out of Skype for Business. And when they are not seeing the kind of service that they expect. In real time, they'll be able to identify the issue and be able to take actions accordingly. And this is something which, which um, you know, I want to press on. This occurs in real time as the call unfolds. So in alternative solutions, what you'll typically see is a report surrounding the user experience, which is only generated once the call happens to be over. Furthermore, that user experience data which is presented in these alternative, um, in alternative solutions, they present an average figure. With what you can see, the work that we've done with Nectar is the Nectar platform has the ability to be able to show 
issues which occur sporadically in real time as a call happens to be progressing. And the Sonus SBC 1000-2000 forwards that data in real time. So those, exper so those degradations which may occur at any given moment, they can be identified when they occur. So this is uh, one of the really cool things that comes out of the integration work that we've done with, uh, with Nectar. So as, as Russell had alluded to earlier, you know, in the alternative implementation, you would be deploying these various um, devices in a branch office that would bracket more or less the equipment that you're uh, placing under test in order to gather voice quality data. And there is some level of effort which you would have to undertake in order to provision that equipment, care for it, feed it, so on and so forth. Because we have eliminated that requirement for bracketing devices around our SPC, because we built that feature in directly into our SPC 1000-2000, one of the ad advantages which is made available is the fact that you can be able to start up the voice quality reporting from the SBC in a very straightforward fashion, straight from the GUI of the SBC 1000-2000. I've captured a few screenshots here. It's very straightforward. It's a simple few mouse clicks. You'd have to enter in a few, a little bit of data surrounding the TLS certificates in order to be able to set up your secure channel to the UCMP, and away you go. The service is started up, and it's it's uh, presents a substantially eased uh, e eased uh, set of actions which the user would have to undertake in order to be able to enable this this really cool feature set. So um, one of the things which we wanted to highlight with the availability of this integration that we've done with Nectar, uh, which recently became available, actually we released this software in the July timeframe. Uh, there is a, a license that would need to be acquired on the part of the enterprise that's deploying the SPC for which they would like to enable this voice quality reporting to the Nectar UCMP. But what we wanted to emphasize was that this license that does have a fee associated with it for the next six months, certainly through to the end of 2016, we will not be charging uh, any fee for that license. So all you'd need to do is as you go about purchasing your SPCs and as you go about deploying your SPCs, you simply need to place a, an order for the uh, license that you see in that last bullet, the Nectar license promo. And for no additional cost, you can enable the voice quality reporting and have it enabled and set up, ready to go in a position to be able to forward voice quality information to the Nectar UCMP. So we're really excited about introducing this. We really wanted to make a, a splash into the marketplace saying that this is, this is a very unique capability that Sonus and Nectar bring to the Skype for Business market and to Skype for Business deployments. Okay, thanks, Umar. What I want to go over here is a couple of the key benefits of the UCMP for SBC offering and the integration we've done with Sonus in particular. So once again, with UCMP for SBC, the idea is to create that clear demarcation point uh, between both the enterprise and the SIP carrier as well as the internet provider. So if there's a problem, we need to know where it is. Right? Is it in the data center that the enterprise is responsible for? Is it the SIP provider? Is it the MTLS provider? So the quicker we determine that, the less time it's spent playing the game of it's not my fault until you can prove who it is um, and get the problem addressed. We also are looking at the proactive monitoring of the SBC and the capacity. So knowing that things are up, things are running, and if we're starting to get to the point where we need to add additional capacity, we know that before we get there. We're also looking at the SIP signaling errors on both sides of the SBC. So this goes back to that clear demarcation point. When we know there's a problem, we now know whose problem it is, and we have the forensic data necessary to hand it to the, the offending party uh, to get the problem addressed. And then the same thing applies with the RTP measurements. Once again, both sides of the SBC, we're doing the bracketing so we know where the problem is and who needs to address it. Now with the Sonus integration work, the idea is to get all the benefits of the UCMP for SBC offer with a lot less ser servers needed for monitoring. So like we showed in the network diagram, we took all of the extra servers out 
uh, to support the remote sites. We don't lose any functionality, but we get rid of those servers, which obviously makes the operating and maintenance uh, much simpler. Uh, once you focus on a single centrally located system, you manage and maintain that. There's only one of them. It's usually easier to get to. Uh, then multiple different servers at multiple remote sites. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the remote access, um, the distributed systems. And as Umar just pointed out in his last slide, it's also the ease of turn up. So I bring up a new site, I install my Sonus SBC, you do the configuration on that necessary to bring it up and get it running, and with two additional screens, a couple of extra fields, you have that SBC call home to the centrally located UCMP server, and then you start monitoring that. So you get full monitoring with just a couple of extra configuration steps at that remote site. Uh, no additional servers to install, no additional configuration there for the, the monitoring solution. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I now have the pleasure of introducing Ken Lasko, our Office Services Services MVP. Uh, he works for Event Zero. Welcome, Ken. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for having me on the show. This is uh, it's very exciting for me. I never usually do these sort of YouTube things before. It's all this newfangled technology stuff, so I'm excited to be part of the, the brave new world. Because typically I'm just stuck. You know, you, I'm stuck in a back room. We do the blogs and I do all that sort of stuff, and that's about it. So about me. So who am I? I am Ken Lasco, who may not appear as illustrated. As you can see, I do not look like the, the wonderful picture that you can see here, who is none other than David Hasselhoff. So yes, I am a David Hasselhoff enthusiast. I do work at Event Zero as a VP of Service Delivery and uh, Product Development. And I've been an Office Servers and Services MVP, which honestly to me still sounds like that I work in a hotel or I work in an office building and I clean offices. But no, really, I am a Skype for Business MVP since 2012. Um, I'm a blogger, not so prolifically these days. It seems like I'm starting to run out of things to say, but uh, there's still lots of really good content from back in the golden days that is still completely valid and good. And if you do recognize this, this pretty face here, not this one here, but that one on the screen there, if you recognize that from somewhere, it might also be from my from the link optimizer. So I'm the guy that has created the link optimizer which saves people around the world from having to manually roll their own dial plans, voice policies, and all that sort of stuff. So the main thing, you can you can usually see me on my blog, Link Optimizer, or you can reach me on Twitter at Ken Lasco. <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today is, since again, I am the voice, the enterprise voice dude, um, I'm gonna be talking about advanced enterprise voice, dial plan, and voice routing. So we're going to be exploring ways that you can provide more control over call behavior and a better experience for users. So what we're going to be assuming here is that you do know all about Skype for Business dial plans and voice policies and all that sort of stuff. So if you don't know anything about that sort of thing, you may be a little bit lost, but hopefully not. And then you also need to have a slightly more than passing familiarity with regular expressions because most of the things that I'm going to be talking about today has to do with regular expressions. So the overall goal of this, this very short presentation, so I just want to see how much time we're spending here, is still the idea is we want to decrease user dialing errors that will overall reduce the system load and increase user satisfaction. So those are all pretty tall orders, and you might think, okay, well, what can I possibly do better to make the experience for users more satisfactory? Well, that's what I'm exactly what I'm going to show you so first thing I want to talk about, and most of the things I'm going to be talking about are just very, very simple tweaks that you can do to your system that's going to make it, can make a huge difference to how users interact with your system. So the first thing I want to show you here is some just some simple normalization rule tweaks that you can do. So if you look at this first one here, this is a very, very, very standard normalization rule uh, that you would get if you were to use the the normalization rule wizard in the Skype for Business control panel when you're creating new normalization rules. And if you just said, okay, I want it, numbers to start with a one and are 11 digits long, I want to put a plus in front of it, this is the normalization rule that will result from that. 
and this works. It works absolutely fine. So you can dial one and 10 more digits, and then it will normalize it properly to plus one area code and subscriber number, which, which is exactly the same, the right format that is used in North America. So it's, it's very clean, it works well, and well, it does its job, right? But so it'll accept any, any 11 digit number starting with a one. So the problem is, is that it will allow non-valid numbers. So like if you try to do an area code like one, two, three, it will happily accept that and try to send that through. And the thing is area codes in North America start at 201 and as, can go as high as 999. Like currently they don't go anywhere near 999, but they're scattered all throughout that range. But there is no area code lower than 200 or lower than 201 that is valid in North America. And then another thing is that subscriber numbers, the last seven digits, uh, can't start with a one or a zero. It's got to start with a two or higher. So a, a phone number like this is a New York area code. Uh, phone number 212-123-4567 is an invalid phone number. You will never see that in the North American dial plan. So how, what can we do to fix this? Well, we can do, we can change our normalization rule. So we can just change our normalization rule to specifically say what area code is, is, is suitable and what subscriber number is suitable. So if, just to give you a bit of background on what this does, this tells you we're still looking for a one and then we're, the next number we're gonna accept is gonna be two to nine. So we're not gonna accept numbers that are zero or one for the start of the area code, then any two digits for the rest of the area code. And then for the subscriber number, doing the same thing. The subscriber number's gotta start with a two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine, and then six digits after that. So you're gonna do that, so that's going to block any invalid, um, any invalid area codes and subscriber number combinations. So this is great because now it's gonna provide users with fast, fast feedback when they're trying to dial, accidentally dial invalid phone numbers. So you can see right here, you can see here encased in red, here is me trying to dial a non-valid um, phone number, an area code one, to three, which is invalid. So the link client is gonna not normalize that and it's just gonna leave it like that. Now the link will still allow you to actually click enter and try to dial it, but what's gonna happen immediately is it's gonna come back and it's gonna say, please check the number and, draw, and try again. If you didn't do this, if you're going with the original format with, the, with uh, just, use, just selecting any 11 digits, what will happen is that phone number is going to be is going to be sent on through, put out to the PSTN, where they're going to hear a message saying, says, we're sorry, this is an invalid phone number. And then, then please hang up and try your call again. This is a recording and it's going to sound awful. It wastes people's time. It increases network traffic probably by a teeny little bit because honestly, uh, how much of an issue is this really? But you know what, like, I'm thinking this is a, a great, Great thing that you can do to, to minimize user errors, minimize network traffic, even that little bit, I figure, you know what, it's easy to do, so why wouldn't you do it? So when you incorporate this same sort of rule into your normalization rules, into your routes as well, you can minimize your network traffic caused by invalid calls. So, so it's just a great thing to do, and why wouldn't you do it? Sure, it's like seriously, like the, 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 the improvement or the gain you're gonna get is, is incredibly minuscule, but why not? It's a simple thing to do. So the key takeaway here is, is what you should do is you should make your normalization rules and routes as specific as possible. And to, to make them make sure that they're as specific as possible for your situation. So that requires you to understand exactly how phone numbers are formatted in your specific country. So I'm using North America here, but there's, there's definitely similar rules that you can just develop for other countries around the world, like the UK, for, for example, which is where Mark is from, right? Right, Mark? That is where he's from, right? He's going to be quiet. That, that's where I am from, yes. Excellent. I can tell by the accent. That's how smart I am. Um, next thing we can talk about is something called overdialing. So what overdialing is, it's essentially meaning that you're dialing more digits than necessary to complete a call. So the, the time you're going to see this the most often is when you're dialing a number as a word. So if you're watching the news or you're watching the, the TV and an ad comes on and says, call 1-800 best deal to get the best deal on your next car. Well, you would pick up the phone and you would dial 1-800 and you start punching in, okay, B is, okay, B is two, E is, is three, 
S is, you know, you go through all that sort of thing. And once you get to the A, which is the seventh number in a, in a North American subscriber number, it would complete the call-in. So even if you click that, if you press the L, you wouldn't know because it's already connected to your call and it's already, it's already uh, ringing. So, but the, what happens in Link, if you're using that original um, dial plan example, if you type in 1-800-BEST-DEAL, you'll see that, thankfully, Link does actually change that to numbers all by itself, which is one of the little-known, most awesome things that Link or Skype for Business does, is it converts letters to the equivalent numbers. So it will happily convert best deal to that entire number, but you'll notice that it, because it's got one extra number, again, it doesn't match that the initial normalization rule of 1 and 10 digits, so it won't normalize. You won't get that right, the right, um, the right feedback, and you can put the call through. Chances are, depending on how everything else in your system is configured, chances are that call will complete properly because at some point in the chain, uh, that that last digit is going to get dropped off, and it might even get dropped off just at the very end when it's going to the PSTN. But the end result is the call generally is going to complete. But again, it doesn't format this number with a plus in front of it and put some nice brackets beside it and things like that. So what you really can do to, to do this is a very, very simple thing. So if you take the example that we already used in the previous example to, to make it more specific for your dialing situation, and all we have to do is add this backslash D star. So what this means is that we're going to be looking for uh, an 11-digit number following the format for North America dial for the dial plan. And then we're also going to be looking for zero or more digits. That's what the backslash, or that's what the, the, the star means here. After the backslash D means digits, and the star means zero or more. So if we see zero or more digits after that, we essentially just lop those off and continue on. So you'll see that when we put that, just put that simple, those last three digits in there, or last three characters in here, now when I put in Whitey Hunter Best Deal, it now form drops that last trailing number and formats it properly. Everybody looks happy and it's great. So this is really specific to North America. Unfortunately, in other countries in the world that use different um, different uh, conventions for displaying their phone numbers, Skype for Business doesn't do anything like that. So as far as I know, if you try to format, if you're trying to you punch in a UK number, it won't separate the area code from the country code. It'll just be a long string of numbers. So this is really only super like good to see in North America. Like I would honestly love to see it if, if Microsoft would make this available, this sort of formatting available for other countries, but I just haven't seen that happen yet. So this is great because this does provide user feedback that numbers formatted correctly. Like it's extremely obvious in North America. Other countries would be less obvious, but you still would see the plus and things would go along just fine. Now extensions, what can we do with extensions? So I'm not talking about taking four digits and normalizing it to E164, and that's because that's an entirely separate topic all on its own. I don't want to get into that. I'm specifically talking about user entered phone numbers from Outlook contacts that have extensions within them. So for instance, someone might have an Outlook contact that's formatted like this. They could just have just literally a string of digits with an X and three, three, five, wonderful. Now, or they might have it two, one, two, one, two, three, four, and then literally typing in the word extension six, seven, eight. That's totally allowed in an Outlook contact. It will happily accept that and work fine. And then uh, a final example, if you're using, if you're in Outlook and you use the little wizard that they, they have a little, not a wizard, but they have a little entry box where you can say, put in the country code, put in the area code, put in the subscriber number, put in the extension, and it will actually format it with a plus and put an X in there and all that sort of stuff. So all these are, are phone numbers that you could potentially see within, uh, within an Outlook contact that someone might want to click on and expect to dial. But the problem is, is that if you tried to send something like extension 678, or even if you did figure out how to normalize this properly to, to say it was actually a properly formatted extension in E164 notation, um, it still would never, you would never get connected to extension 678 because that's just not how the PSTN works. Yeah, so since you can't dial external numbers with extensions properly via the PSTN, you have to strip the extension. So the easiest way to do that is to just do that in a normalization rule. So again, using the same example that we used previously, you can just add this to the end of it in brackets followed by a question mark. So what this means here means it's going to be looking for any non-digit 
So it means any combination of ext or extension or x or extension colon or anything that's not a digit, it's going to be looking for one or more of those followed by one or more digits. So that would encompass just about any possible way that someone could type the word extension something inside of Skype for Business. And then the question mark says it may or may not be present. This entire string may or not be present. So you can roll this all into one normalization rule. And if someone clicks an extension inside uh, or a phone number inside of Outlook with an extension on it, then when it gets presented in link, it will get stripped off before it gets dialed and it will get sent on down the chain and everything should should function properly. So this is again another way of dealing with, with situations where people might have tons of phone numbers for, for their contacts stored within Skype for Business or sorry, inside of Outlook. And this gives them just a just that little bit of the easier way to dial those numbers. So they can just click it within Outlook and it'll automatically dial it inside of Skype for Business. So it's another way that you can use to make your users a little happier, uh, be able to dial things simpler and be able to dial it the first time without any and the next thing I want to talk about is selective caller ID blocking. So this is a feature that some companies really like to use. They want to make, make sure that they're presenting, they're blocking their phone number before they're calling certain people. You see this a lot in legal firms and things like that. So you'll see this in a lot of countries. You, they do allow blocking of caller ID by entering something like star 67 before dialing the phone number. So that allows you to block your phone number selectively. You do that before that phone number, and then your, your phone number is going to be blocked. It'll probably show up as private or something like that. So you can somewhat replicate this in Skype for Business, but there are some caveats to that. So you can't actually block caller ID. Your number won't show up as private. So you can only, what you can do is you can only replace the user's phone number with another number. So you can make that like the central office number. You can make it some bogus number, which depends on, depending on the rules of your country, you may not be, maybe may be frowned upon, but you can replace that with any phone number. And so you can, you can set it up so that you, People can dial star 67 before dialing the number and they can get the same, relatively the same experience. So to do this, you have to have a normalization rule, a route and a trunk translation rule all set up in conjunction with each other to, to do this. And the best way to do this is you can take advantage of some of the lesser known features of the SIP RFC 3966, which allows you to do some pretty funky things that you normally would never actually see. It's, it's buried in there. Link Skype for Business actually does adhere to this for the most part, and you can take advantage of this. So the first thing you have to do to do this is you can create a normalization rule that takes the caller ID block code that you want to use. So you can use star 67. If you do use star, it has to be star or pound, obviously, because those are the only numbers that are available on a keypad. And But if you use star or pound, you make sure you have to preface that with a backslash as the escape sequence to make sure that it says, yeah, this is actually a backslash or a star that we want to put in there. So we're using 67 here in our example. And you'll notice this is preceded by the question mark colon and all of its encompassed in brackets. So what that really means is that if this is present, um, don't include this in the, um, in the replacement sequence in, in regex. I never know the exact terminology you use for this, but uh, everything in brackets can be referenced by, like you can say, okay, take whatever's in brackets and put it in and, and use this in the translated phone number. So normally this would be dollar sign one, and this would be dollar sign two. But if we always want to make sure that we're just using dollar one for the for, for this, because maybe you want to make this optional by putting a question mark here, putting this here will make your life a heck of a lot simpler because you can just say, well, ignore this sequence, ignore this sequence, in the replacement here. So that means that this is ignored and then this one is going to be used as the as the first replacement option in regex here. So we're using so we're putting that in front there and then we say we're going to put it we're going to translate it to whatever the phone number is in E164 notation and we're also going to add something like caller ID replace equals replace. So this is a custom parameter that is absolutely allowed in the RFC. And Skype for Business does allow this too. So I selectively decided I'm gonna use caller ID equals replace. You can use whatever you want for your custom parameter. So the key is you gotta be consistent. Always use lowercase, because what I found out if I tried to use caller ID with the capitals here is that when it went through to the route, 
Skype for Business automatically put it to, to lowercase, and then it didn't match the route because it was looking for specifically looking for uppercase ID. So you got to make sure everything's in lowercase, otherwise it won't work. And the nice thing is, is that in this way, so when someone puts in star 67 and puts in the phone number, what comes back in the normalized view does not include this custom parameter. That is completely hidden in the UI, so it's very nice. So the user will just see the normalized numbers they would expect to see it. They wouldn't see any extra stuff alongside here. It's hidden in the background, but it's still being sent through. So it's a really, really nice way to be able to do caller ID blocking without really interfering with the, the look and feel of Skype for Business. So then finally, you do need a matching route to replace the caller ID, because that's the whole way that, that replacing caller ID works. It's based on the route level. So if a call comes through and it's getting sent to a specific route, then you can replace the caller ID with define that within the route. So you need a route that is basically set up to say, look for any phone number, North American phone number, and make sure it's looking for caller ID replace. And if it sees that, then well, then it's gonna, that's the route that's gonna be used. And then finally, you need a trunk translation rule because you need to strip this before you send it to the PSTN because depending on your provider, they may not be expecting things like this and they may decide to reject your call. So the best course of action is to make sure it never gets there in the first place and everybody's happy. All right. And then the last thing I want to talk about, I specifically want to talk about this because this is something that is endemic to countries like the UK. We're talking about working around stupid number presentation customers, customs, sorry. Uh, so click the dial is in Internet Explorer is a great feature. So it allows you to, you see a number on a web page, you'll see the little Skype logo beside it, and you can click on it and it'll automatically dial. It's a fantastic feature. Until you come across websites, corporate websites that don't understand that people outside of the country might want to reach them. So I call out the UK specifically because they are the worst offenders for this sort of thing. So what happens is the UK love to put their, their national dialing prefix, which is zero. So if you're not from the UK and you're from North America, your national dialing prefix is a number that you dial before you dial any long distance or national level number. So most places in the world outside of North America, that number is, is actually zero. So for whatever bizarre reason, the UK people seem to think that they need to include this zero whenever they show a number on a website. Problem is, uh, outside of the UK, you do not dial their national dialing prefix. In, outside of that country. So if, you, if you're like me, you don't know what's going on outside that country. If you dial the zero after that, if you, like if you click on that number and it's dialed as is with four, four, and then zero, you're going to get, a call, your call cannot be completed this time because that is just, that's not a valid number. You're not supposed to, to use the zero in there. So, of course, everybody in the UK knows this, but nobody outside the UK knows this. People in North America are always being caught up by this, going, okay, I'm dialing the number, it's not working, why isn't it working? And then the UK guy says, oh, are you trying to dial a zero? Yeah, no, don't dial that, it's in brackets, that means don't dial it. He goes, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, why would you do that? Because it is a very odd thing. So, so rather than educating everybody in the UK and teaching them how to format their phone numbers properly for international consumption, we can work around that. So the easiest fix, and I put easiest in quotes because it really isn't all that easy, is you need to create an international normalization rule to strip zeros that immediately follow the area code. So the UK is bad for this. Uh, Netherlands is another one. There are a few other countries that, are, that, that do this on a fairly frequent basis, but um, I don't know what they all are in the world. How many, like I haven't bothered to go to websites in every country in the world to determine this with any sort of uh, um, um, certainty. So you know what? Let's just do this for every country in the world. So the first thing you need to do to do this, if you want to build this, is you need a list of every country code in the world. And then you need to know which countries actually use zero in their phone number. So usually putting zero in the beginning of a phone number, like as actual part of the phone number that you dial internationally, is not done. The only country that actually does this are Italy and the Republic of the Congo. So I don't know what that says about those two countries, but those are the only countries that were dialing zero is actually a valid thing. And so what you want to do is, is you want to strip that zero if it is present after the country code. So I'll bore you with the details, but what we do here is this is an example for North America here is we 
So here it is. Here's the normalization rule for stripping a zero out from, from an internationally dialed phone number from anywhere outside anywhere, basically. So th what this is here is it says look for a plus at the beginning, if it's there or not. Then look for 011, which is the North America International Dialing Code. So you dial 011 before you dial any phone number generally. And then here are all the country codes of the world all put into one handy little regex. And I call out here is, is, is Italy. So I put 39. And then so I don't, I want to make sure that the next zero isn't blocked. So I just say, okay, if 39 and then anything else comes after that, including a zero, we want to let it through. And the same thing for the Congo. We want to do that there. And so these are all the country codes. And then here is that zero. So we're saying, okay, if the zero is present, then strip it. And then follow that off by um, six to 14 digits, which are the maximum number of valid digits that you will ever see in an international phone number. And again, just like we showed in the previous example, is strip the extension or anything like that if there's one there. And then you translate that to dollar to, to plus dollar one dollar two. So that's dollar one represents the country code. Dollar two represents everything else beyond that, behind that, and you're golden. You're off to the races. So um, it, this works very well. Um, I put this in all my all my environments now, and it, it seems to work pretty much flawlessly. So it, it's it's a great addition. So you can, this is so much work to do some of these things. Like, yeah, sure, the first few normalization rules, those are pretty straightforward. There's a few characters to add. So it is a lot of work. So you can do all this stuff manually. Or, hey, here's my plug for my tool. It's free. I don't know why I'm plugging it, but it's, it's there. It's the link dialing rule optimizer. Really should be called the Skype for business dialing rule optimizer, but I'm lazy. I'm just leaving it the way it is. That's the way everybody knows it. And this is my beautiful website. It really does need an update to the UI, as I've been told by many people. But I'm not a UI guy. I just make it work. It works. I'm leaving it the way it is. But you can do this. You can use the link dialing rule optimizer to incorporate all these examples that I've shown you previously into one beautiful package that you execute onto your link environment. And it will create all these rules, set things up so that all your users can do things in very easily, simply, and accurately. So again, so these mostly simple tricks can really enhance the user experience. So you're reducing misdialed phone numbers. It works with, out, with phone numbers of dubious quality from Outlook, again, because there's no control over how phone numbers are formatted inside Outlook contact. So what you're gonna result in is that you're gonna get a higher percentage of successfully dialed phone numbers on the first try from all kinds of different sources. Web pages, Outlook contacts, just manually dialed. All these things are going to allow people to, to, to make these phone calls successfully the first time without having to go, well, what did I do wrong? So you can use this, use the link dialing rule optimizer to do it all in one package. So that's my plug there. So if you want more information on all this, if you want more information on overdialing, selective caller ID blocking, or stupid number presentation workaround, you can take a look at my blog post. And with that, that is the end of my presentation. I hope uh, you guys all found it useful. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Ken. That was very enlightening and very uh, amusing. So uh, thank, it's, uh, thank you for coming on to the show. Um, hey, you're welcome. And from all the people in the UK, I thank you for calling us out as being idiots when it comes to number yep. dialing. That, that's cool. Funny, we, we, like we, I we actually called that. out. I called out a few websites on my blog, like AstraZeneca, and that specific one, example that I used has actually been corrected. So, so I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody out there from AstraZeneca follows my blog, I don't know, but I did find more examples on AstraZeneca's blog. So if you're out there, whoever's at AstraZeneca managing the website, you got more work to do. <laughs> Excellent, right. So um, announcements for, for this show. So the Skype show will be at UC Day on the 24th of October this year. And uh, the aim for the Skype show being there is to provide a report on what's going on at UC Day. Never been before, it should be interesting. But we will be in the Expo Hall on the stage and we'll be hopefully broadcasting live on Channel 9 for at least a portion of the, the day, uh, all things being well. Um, and if not, it'll be pre-recorded and you can catch up after the, after the day. And uh, 
if you're going I look forward to seeing you there if you're um, a vendor and you're in the in the expo hall and you want to come on and, and be interviewed about your product then uh, please do so let, let me know Moving on to discussions, um, there's not been much going on in the Skype for Business world from the likes of Microsoft and vendor announcements in the last month. It's probably mainly down to the fact that Ignite's just around the corner and they're saving all the good stuff for that. Um, a quick scoot around on Twitter and the normal social feeds so picked out a few um, points to talk about perhaps. And the first one is apparently the cloud video interrupt service from Polycom and their collaboration with Microsoft is now available for preview in skypreview.com. So if you have Cisco Tamburg devices um, or other uh, Polycom HDX devices and you want to test out the video interrupt to Skype for Business Online, go and sign up to preview.com right now and accepting registrations at this moment in time. I noticed that while I was on there as well, PSTN conference in the housements uh, preview is, is there for registration purposes as well. Um, must admit there's not much detail on what those enhancements are right now, but uh, if you have E5 or you have a qualifying license for PSTN conference in Skype for Business Online, sign up to, uh, to that preview too. And this one's probably for Ken. Apparently we can now normalize numbers with a plus. So do you want to talk us yeah. through about that? Well, it was while I was kind of doing some use cases and playing around with stuff while I was doing up the presentation for this that I, I kind of came across this and noticed, wait a minute, if I had a normalization role with a, with, with a plus on it, it was actually normalizing. And it had been a very long time since I tried this. It's just been one of those things that I've, I've taken as, as gospel is that if the phone numbers, if you've got a phone number coming in with a plus already on it, it will be ignored for normalization. So I've been going along by with that forever. And suddenly I noticed that it was working. And, and I'm like, this is crazy. So I put it up on, on my blog, but in my haste to put it up there, I failed to I failed to be explicitly clear about the situation and when this was working. And so when I looked at it the next morning, it seemed, oh, wait a minute, I'm implying that any normalization rule will fire if even if a phone number's got a plus on it, but which is not the case, you have to explicitly make sure your normalization rule is looking for the plus at, at the beginning. So, so if you've got your normalization rules based on no pluses, then you're fine, which most people will, especially if they're using the link optimizer. So I kind of got people like all worried about it, and then I did a little bit more research on this and found out that, okay, well, the link 2010 client under Skype for Business 2016 server functions the same way. So I'm not sure if this is something that's always been there or has been there for a very long time and I've just never known or what. So I had one guy in my comp in my blog already made a comment saying, yeah, he was pretty sure he did this in Link 2013 once already, but nobody else has come forward talking about this yet. But to me, this is actually a big thing because this does, like this allows you to, to normalize numbers when you're using click the dial from a web page, like I use in the example here. It's a, it's a big thing. It's actually, it's great that it works. So I've now incorporated this newfound knowledge of mine that maybe everybody else already knows about. I put this into the link optimizer so that it's available for the world. Excellent. And I'm not sure if you, if you seen the announcements, I don't follow Cisco that much to be honest. Um, but they have announced, um, they're using their Akano acquisition to good use. So they have released Cisco meeting server. Um, and the purpose of the meeting server is to allow integration between Cisco BTCs and Skype for Business um, and also the ability to do um, screen sharing between the two systems as well apparently uh, from what I'm reading in the Cisco newsroom. Um, it's a long time coming. It's, it's nice to see that other vendors um, are actually recognizing that Skype for Business is becoming more prevalent in the enterprise space. And, um, you know, I see good things coming from Cisco. Um, and a few other uh, points um, that I noticed on, on Twitter just before we started recording. Um, Alessio Giambini's done a blog today, um, apparently the Skype for Business 2016 client only supports version 16 protocol of ICE, which will, if you're using Exchange 2007 uh, unified messaging, then you're going to have a problem using Skype for Business 2016 clients. 
uh, as of the latest update. So uh, that's mainly because I think the reading this blog quickly, I think it was version six that uh, Exchange UM supports in, in ICE protocol. And the other one, um, no jitter post today um, from Brian Rigg. And he was discussing that apparently service providers have entered the market for Cloud Connector Edition as well. Have you seen that as well, Ken? Time to look into it yet, but um, there's some discussion on the MVP site about that too. So we're yeah, going to be so mailing list. Apparently, it's not officially supported from Microsoft. Microsoft haven't actually released anything special to um, to service providers, but apparently Orange Business uh, Solutions and Tata um voice solutions as well they they're starting starting to implement it in their own way and finding that it works so it's kind of an interesting concept really for um hosting providers to compete with the likes of skype for business online i think so and the last one microsoft ignite so this is coming up next month i believe can you go to be there that's a month yep i'm gonna be there got my dancing shoes ready yeah, are you doing a presentation there, or are you just attending? No, I didn't get. I, it's been kind of a busy spring summer here, in my house. So it's, uh, yeah, it wasn't something that was in the cards this year for me. I'm, I'm afraid, but I will be there with bells on, uh, representing Event Zero, and so will a number of my compatriots who are all. will be there in bright green shirts. We'll be hanging around the little Skype for Business booth, I'm sure, and Polycom, I'm sure. So look for us. Cool. So sadly, I won't be able to make it um, for reasons that I can't disclose in the public space. Uh, <laughs> but we'll leave it at that. So anybody who's going to ignite, have a great time, um, and I may see you next year. And that's it for this show um, for September. I will see you again in October, just before UC Day. Um, and I forget who I have on in, in October. Who have I got? Oh, I have Jeff Shirts from Polycom. That'll be a good one. Uh, yeah, so hopefully. Um, Better than this one with me. Nah, it yeah. will. That's awesome. Um, not sure what Jeff's going to talk about. I try, probably around H264, I would imagine. Um, but uh, I'll firm those details up later on. Normally, I would say thrilling in a very sarcastic way, but with Jeff, it actually would be interesting. <laughs> All right. Sure it will. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching this episode and see you next time. Goodbye.